It's a genuine pleasure to have you in our audience. I want to talk to you today about what I conceive to be one of the very most important subjects to which the human mind can address itself. And even though our lesson is going to be directed toward what the New Testament teaches us who are living today to do, I want to use as a text a passage from the Old Testament. Of course, we today, we who live today, are not living under the law of Moses, the Old Testament. That law was nailed to the cross, and we now live under the gospel of Jesus Christ. But the principles that by which God acted in the Old Testament are the same principles by which he acts today. It's just that the details of the teaching are some different. Now let us notice in Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 26 to 28. And I'll be reading from the American Standard Version. Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. The blessing, if ye shall hearken unto the commandments of Jehovah your God, which I command you this day. And the curse, if ye shall not hearken unto the commandments of Jehovah your God. But turn aside out of the way which I command you this day, to go after other gods which ye have not known. Now you see, God there gave man the choice. Choose you this day which way you will go. Will you follow the plan that I give you, or will you follow the plan of merely some man, eventually of Satan? Every plan that man has, that is not the plan of God, has its basic origin in Satan. And so we look at the title of our study today, Which Plan Works? Man's or God's? God has only one plan for man today, and that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. No other covenant, even of the Bible, is the means by which we can be saved. The principles apply that applied in the Old Testament they apply in the new, but the details are not the same. Which plan works, man's or God's? I envision here a drawing board with a T-square used by an architect and some sort of engineer, a draftsman, to bring about a plan that others can understand and follow, and perhaps make something, an airplane, a pump, an automobile, whatever. But God's plan is the thing that is an antagonism to the plans of men. The plans of men are an antagonism to the plans of God. There's a passage in Matthew chapter 7, I mean chapter 21, verses 23 to 37. And the Jews, Jewish leaders came to Jesus and asked him uh, in regard to the baptism of John. Um, they asked him, by what authority doest thou these things, the things that you're doing? By what authority are you doing them? And Jesus said, before I answer your question, I want to ask you one. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or from men? They got off to the side and talked it over, and they said, if we say from men, uh, then we are afraid of the people, because they all hold that John is a prophet. If we say that that baptism was from God, then he will say, why then didn't you obey him? So you see, they were put into what we call a dilemma. They didn't know which way to go. They were hung on either horn they might choose. And so they came back to Jesus and not telling the truth, of course, said, we don't know. And Jesus replied to them, then I will not tell you the answer to the, to the question you ask me. If people show dishonesty, there is really no use in dealing with them. The Bible is easy to understand if a person is honest. And so we come to the point of asking again, which plan works, man's or God's? As a sort of an introductory thing, I want us to note that everything we believe and do in religion is either by a man's plan or it is by God's plan. You cannot follow the plan devised by any man something that some man thought of, perhaps is written in a book, or has preached it, and it's something other than the plan of God, and it be pleasing to God. That's the point. That's the study that we're after today. It is simply not true, as we hear on almost every hand, that so long as a man is sincere and religious, good moral man perhaps, it doesn't matter what he preaches, 
or what he does for his own soul's salvation, if it's not the plan of God, it won't work. I think you'll be able to see if you never have seen it before. If you'll have your own Bible handy and study with me as we go through this, you'll see that what I'm telling you on this matter is true. The plans of men always fail. Moses made clear that there were two choices, either to follow the plan of God or to follow the plan of men. And he indicated that if you follow the plan of man, you'll result in a curse. I set before you this day a blessing and a curse, Moses said. A blessing if you follow God's plan and a curse if you follow a man's plan. That same thing in principle is true today. If you follow God's plan, the gospel of Christ, which is addressed to everybody on this earth, then you'll be saved. And if you live the faithful Christian life in obedience to that gospel, you'll be saved with God in eternity. But if you follow a plan of men, it will not result in your salvation. You may be thinking, well, that's true of you also. Of course it is. If I'm not preaching the plan of God, I will rest under the curse of God. Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 to 9. If I'm not living the gospel of Christ, I will rest under the anathema of God. That's true of all of us. The thing that we need to impress upon our mind is, must we be in subservience to God by obeying his will? Is it really necessary for us to become a Christian and to live as a faithful Christian to follow God's plan? This passage makes clear in principle that you must follow God. But we'll see as we go along from the New Testament, this same basic truth. Now let's look for a moment at types of truth. Truth is taught in the Bible by precept. That is, it just says something in so many words. We have an explicit statement, so many words. Those statements will imply other things that are not stated explicitly. At other times, we have what some people call examples, but which are really accounts of action, where somebody says, well, this prophet went over to that land and did thus and so, and God was pleased with him, or he was not pleased with him. That is an account of action. And so let's look first of all at pr a proof by precept. And I have there on the chart three passages, but I want to look at only one of them, and I hope that you will jot down the other two and study them for yourselves. In Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 to 9, the Apostle Paul <clears throat> He expresses amazement that the Christians at Galatia, of the Galatian congregations, were uh, drifting away from the gospel of Christ into accepting another gospel, which is not another gospel. He's there saying, you're accepting a, another gospel of a different kind, but you're not accepting another gospel of the same kind. The gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation, but the gospel of any man, any message that he claims will be the gospel, will not save you. It will rest only or bring you to the point of resting only under the anathema of God. And he went on to make clear that even if an apostle or an angel were to preach unto you any gospel other than that which was preached unto you, let him be anathema. Think about that for a moment, my friends. If you are not following the gospel of Christ, you will rest under the curse of God. Now let's look hurriedly. We'll have to do this in a big hurry. Proof by example. Adam and Eve, they followed their own plan. They followed the plan that the serpent gave them, and they were... Uh, under the anathema of God. They were cast out of the garden. The people of Noah's day who would not be obedient to God. Of all the people on earth at that time, only eight people, Noah and his family, were saved. That shows if you have not understood the severity of God, as we find in the 11th chapter of Romans in the 22nd verse, behold then the goodness and the severity of God. And what it amounts to is this, that God's goodness flows to those who are obedient and his severity flows to those who are not. The people of Noah day were lost because they were not obedient. Cain did not act by faith in contrast to his brother uh, Abel, and he was resting under the anathema of God. King Saul was disobedient, and he was punished severely. His days he was shut off from being king. Israel refused to go into the promised land, even under the uh, direction of Caleb and Joshua. Nadab and Abihu offered strange fire, fire that God had not authorized them to use in the offering of sacrifice. And the fire came forth from heaven and devoured them in a moment. You see how that ought to help us to see that we cannot follow the plan of our own devising and be pleasing to God. 
Naaman at first refused to go when God told him through the prophet to go and dip in the river Jordan seven times so that he might be healed of his leprosy. But his servant came to him and he said, Master, if he had told you some great thing to do, you'd have done it. Now why not do this? And so Naaman could see the sense of that. And by faith, he went to the river Jordan and he dipped seven times and he came and his flesh became whole and clean as a child. The question is, did any plan of man succeed? Not a single one of them. My friends, you cannot find where the plan of any man succeeded in the Bible to bring the blessing of God. On the other hand, we see here that the plan of God always succeeds. Deuteronomy 11, 26 and 28 again, where uh, Moses made clear that if you follow God, you will be the recipient of a blessing. Now, I want to prove that. I want to prove that the Bible teaches this. Let's look, first of all, at proof by precept. That is, in just so many words. In Hebrews chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, we learn that Christ is the author of eternal salvation to all those that obey him. I'd like you to jot down and read for yourself also John 6, 37 and 2 John 9 to 11. Notice this clear statement that God will save those who obey him. The Lord Jesus Christ is the author of eternal salvation salvation to those that obey him. Further, we'll look by precept, account of action. As long as Adam and Eve obeyed God, they continued to have the blessings of the Garden of Eden. Abel offered his sacrifice by faith, Hebrews 11 and 4, and therefore God approved of him in contrast to his disapproval and condemnation of his brother Cain, who did not offer his sacrifice by faith. Noah and his family were saved when they obeyed God in the building of the ark to the saving of their souls, as we read in Hebrews 11 and also in 1 Peter chapter 3. The brazen serpent in the, in the wilderness, those who'd been bitten by serpents and then were told to look upon the serpent of brass on a pole, all of them who looked received the cleansing or healing of their snake bite. The walls of Jericho fell down after the children of Israel marched about it once each day for six days and seven times on the seventh day, and then the uh, blowing on the ram's horn with a shout, and the walls fell. If they had failed in those uh, acts of obedience, then they, the walls would not have fallen. Naaman, as I told you earlier, so long as he refused to go to the river that God appointed and to dip the appointed number of times in the water, he remained a leper, but when he obeyed God, then his flesh was made clean. In John chapter 9, the blind man, when Jesus told him to go and wash in the pool of Siloam, Jesus had put clay, made clay of spittle and put it on his eyes and told him to go and wash in the pool of Siloam. He went and washed and came seeing. You see, it's just that simple. God has a plan. He tells us about it. It's in the New Testament. All you have to do is to learn it Believe it and obey it, and Bible, the Bible teaches plainly that you will be saved. You'll be a Christian, and if you live the faithful Christian life, you'll be with God in heaven in eternity. And so the big question is, what is God's plan for those of us living today? There are a number of passages, of course. There is a sense in which it's the totality of the New Testament. There are many passages which, in effect, sum it up in just two or three sentences, two or three verses. But here is one that gives the details very precisely. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 to 6. Here the Apostle Paul, as he is guided by the Holy Spirit, says, There is one body and one spirit, even as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all who is over all and in all and through all and in all. Ephesians 4, 4 to 6. That is God's plan. Let's look at it in some detail. I want to show you, first of all, in the matter of God. Over here, I have the plans of men, and over here, I have the plan of God. Now, are the plans of men just as good as the plan of God? Men say that. I hear preachers all the time who say that. I hear them on radio. I see them on television. I read their books. I read their papers. And they say that the plan of man is just as good as God's as long as you're sincere. My friends, that is simply not true. That is the doctrine of Satan. It is not the doctrine of God. God's plan is there is one. Men say, well, there are many, there are many gods and one's as good as another or else is not any at all. 
Some men say there is no God. They're atheists. Other men, they're polytheists. They say there are many gods and one is as good as another. But the Bible says there is one. Can I be pleasing to God if I say there's either no God or many gods? Absolutely not. I must believe in the one true living God. Hebrews 11 and 6 says, Without faith it is impossible to be well-pleasing unto God, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he's a reward of them that diligently seek him. What about the Lord Jesus Christ? Some men say there are many saviors, and others say none. But God's plan says there is one. There is just one Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, Except you believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. What about the Holy Spirit? Men say there are many spirits, many revelators, and others say there's none. They all say that they're just as one's as good as another, but the Bible says there is one, one Holy Spirit, one person in the Godhead who has given us the Bible by inspiring the apostles and the prophets. In the fourth chapter of Ephesians, we also see the matter of hope. Some men say there are many hopes, and one's as good as another, and others say there's none. But my friends, the Bible says there's one. There's a lot of difference between many or none and one. One hope of life everlasting. You live in hope of life everlasting means that you not only desire it, but you expect it because you have learned the truth and you're obeying the truth. Now in the matter of faith, this means the body of faith. It means the New Testament. They contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered unto the saints, said Jude in Jude 3. And so we look at the matter of faith, or messages, or gospel. Men say there are many or none. Some people say there's many and one's as good as another. You can go to heaven by following any religion in the world. And other men say all of religion is just a lot of hogwash, as it were, and it does no good to do any of them. So men say, some men say many, others say none, so far as one faith or one message, but God says there's one. My friends, it's just not as good to say or to follow the plan of man as it is the plan of God. I challenge you to find in the Bible where Jesus ever taught that anyone can be saved by another gospel, that is, other than the gospel which he sent. Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 to 9 makes clear that is simply not true. Then there's the matter of baptism. Some people say there are many baptisms. Holy Spirit are in water, uh, sprinkling or pouring or immersion, and one's as good as another. It makes no difference. But other men say there's none, not any with any uh, validity, not any with any value, because all of religion is simply no good. So men say some, many, and others say none, but God says there's one. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 to 6, as surely as there is one God and one Lord Jesus Christ and one Holy Spirit and one faith, there is one baptism, and it's immersion in water unto the forgiveness of sin. There is also the matter of the body or the church. Men say there are many churches, one is as good as another. Others say there's none of any value, but the Bible teaches there is one. According to the plan of God, there is one church purchased by the blood of Christ. As a summary thing, let us look at this. On each side, I have the plans of men in regard to this matter in the middle. In the middle is the plan of God. Men say, in regard to God, some say many and others say none. But the Bible says there's one. In regard to the Lord Jesus Christ, some say there are many saviors and others say none, but God says there's one. In regard to the Holy Spirit, many say there are many revelators, others say none, but the Bible says there is one. In regard to hope of life everlasting, many say there are many hopes, and one's as good as another, others say none. Some say in regard to faith, there are many, others say none. In regard to baptism, some say many, others say none. In regard to the body of the church, some, many, some men say many, and others say none. But in every case, there is one. My friends, I want you to look at this. Here is God's wonderful plan. Look at this big one here. I want to impress that upon your mind. The New Testament teaches, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 to 6, there is one body, the church, there is one spirit, the Holy Spirit, there is one hope of life everlasting, there is one Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, there is one faith, the gospel, there is one baptism, immersion in water unto the remission of sins by the grace of God through the blood of Christ, and there is one God, the everlasting God who created the heavens and the earth and man and all things that are in it.
May God help you to see God's plan and follow it is my earnest prayer.